This is our regularly scheduled planning and land use management uh, committee. On uh, at this time, we'll ask uh, Mr. McGee if you will get us started by calling the roll. Uh, for sure, uh, Council Member Harris Dawson. Present. Council Member Gilbert Cedillo. Uh, Council Member Bob Blumenfield. Blumenfield present. Council Member John Lee. Present. Councilwoman Rodriguez. Here. Uh, that's four members and a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mejia. Everybody, we've got a full meeting agenda today. Uh, so we'll begin our meeting by first taking public comments on individual items, multiple agenda items, and general public comments. Our goal is to get to as many speakers as we possibly can. We will then move through the agenda one item at a time, listen to staff presentations and vote on items accordingly. Uh, there are additional uh, rules to public comment, which will be read into the record at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 161-644-6631 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. During public comment, city staff will call on members of the public by the last four digits of their phone number. By pressing star 9, callers raise their virtual hand to request to speak. Once a caller hears the last four digits of their phone number, an automated Zoom voice will ask the caller to press star 6 to unmute themselves when it is their turn to speak. Once the caller is ready to speak, they must state their name and the items they are calling to speak on. Failure to do so will result in the call being muted and subsequently disconnected. Appellants and or their representatives and applicants and or their representatives will be allowed to speak for a total of three minutes per side unless otherwise noted by the chair. Members of the public wishing to speak on one agenda item only shall have an opportunity to speak for one minute. Appellants and applicants will be given an opportunity to speak when it is their item when their item is called. Each app appellant and applicant has a total of three minutes to speak. An appellant can choose to have a single representative speak on his or her behalf or divide the three minutes among his or her team. Anyone else, including an attorney or project manager, wishing to speak on an appellant's behalf who does not do so during this three minute period may offer one minute of public comment whenever the committee chairperson opens a public comment period for the meeting which is usually at the beginning of the meeting. Therefore, we expect that applicants and appellants have their respective teams assembled and ready to present at the appropriate time today. Members of the public wishing to speak on more than one item shall state that and shall be allowed to speak for a total of two minutes. Failure to raise your hand to speak in a timely manner before the comment period for the item ends results in forfeiture of the opportunity to participate in public comment for this item. Madam City Attorney, please provide additional guidance on public comment. Adrian, Adrian uh, corresponding uh, City Attorney's Office. Oh, sorry, Council Member. I'm sorry. Uh, Council Member Cedillo, for the record. Present. Duly noted. Adrian, corresponding City Attorney's Office. Uh, when speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you're speaking on an agenda item, I will provide one brief warning. If you do not immediately and clearly return to the topic, or if you continue to stray off topic and disrupt the meeting, you will forfeit the rest of your time, and we will move on to the next speaker. We will inform you when your time is up. Thank you so much. Uh, before we turn to public comment, I want to open the floor for amendments uh, for any of the items on today's agenda. So we get those in if we have any from uh, Department of City Planning or from impacted council offices or from members of the committee. Uh, now is the time to make those. All right, seeing none, I uh, have one that I want to introduce for item number seven, uh, Mr. Mejia. Uh, one, reinsert the following language in attachment two, LAMC 104.03A2, section three, any entity that is incorporated outside of the United States. 
Two, instruct the Department of Cannabis Regulation and the Office of Finance in, co in consultation with the city attorney to prepare a report with recommendations within 90 days on foreign ownership to have a better understanding of how much foreign financial investment exists in the city's cannabis market and the implications of keeping the prohibition. Duly noted, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. And uh, now we'll go to public comment. Hi, this is Robin Rudisell regarding agenda item five, the Venice Median Permanent Supportive Housing and Commercial Uses and Visitor Serving Public Garage Project. The changes outlined in the motion are um, gross errors that should have been caught in the process prior to final approval. I don't understand why the updated exhibits 1B and 15 to the Venice Coastal Zone specific plan are being removed. Also, I would like to understand the review process and why these errors were not caught before the project was approved. What other errors are there? This fits right into what I believe are a multitude of errors. This is a complex project, and I suspect there are many more errors that were not caught due to the inadequate review. <clears throat> also, once again, a PSH project does not require a zone change to commercial. Thus, the changes to a commercial zone requires environmental review and is not exempt. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with the number ending in 5222, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hello? We can hear you, Speaker. Okay, great. Um, I'm Allison Christie here to speak on item 3. Um, I work with Better Neighbors Los Angeles. We fight for the enforcement of the home sharing ordinance to ensure that housing across the city is not lost or transformed into illegal vacation rentals. I wanted to express our support for a study of more effective enforcement policies, which will hopefully provide residents of the city with an accurate snapshot of the state of enforcement of the home sharing ordinance. Better Neighbors LA has worked with residents across the city who share similar frustrations with illegal short-term rentals in their neighborhood, and we found that planning's enforcement actions, when taken, are often ineffectual. The proposed report would not only identify what isn't working, but also identify more successful enforcement models across the country that are curbing the illegal conversion of housing into tourist accommodation. In a city with an ever-growing affordable housing crisis, we believe that protecting housing, especially rent-stabilized housing, should be a top priority for city officials and our city's planning department. We believe that the home sharing ordinance already provides the tools to planning and related departments to enforce illegal home sh enforce against illegal home sharing ordinance rentals, and they should be able to crack down on those violations. Thank you, Speaker. All That's your time. Ordinance. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ann Gagan. I'm calling to uh, item number 13 to support the appeal of 655 Franklin Avenue. According to the notice of exemption, a, a, a official document on file, it does not place this project in Alcus Priolo or um, very high fire severity zones according to Zemus. I don't know what Zemus they were referring to that they put in that document. It most certainly is in very high fire severity zone, according to Zemus, and Alcus Priolo zone, which would not allow the kind of density bonus this project is requesting due to it also being a hillside community. In the event we have an earthquake or a fire catastrophe, we have huge evacuation issues here. We are begging you to please do something about this. Those densities, those lower densities for very high fire severity zones are there for a reason. It's for our public safety. Is the city willing to take the responsibility if we have a catastrophe like that and we cannot get out of our hillside community because the city gives density bonuses way above beyond what is allowed in a very high fire severity zone? We sent the map, we sent the Zemus paperwork Thank you, into the That's file. Your time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eldon Rhodes, and I would like to express my support for agenda item number three, increased research on effective enforcement of the home sharing ordinance. 
I live in a rent-stabilized complex within Los Angeles' fifth council district. Units on this property are categorically ineligible for home sharing, yet there are multiple short-term rentals operating my building. Despite submitting a complaint to sitting planning with Better Home Neighbors LA, I've not heard back about any enforcement action. I've seen firsthand the various ways hosts circumvent the HSO to use residential housing for profit. Hosts falsely advertise their units for 30 days or more, use fake home sharing registration numbers, and claim false exemptions for which they are ineligible. City planning even acknowledges they've been powerless to stop this kind of fraud in their September 8, 2021 report to this honorable city council. The contract with the enforcement platform API provider Granicus LLC is costing the city planning office $1.5 million per year and claims an 83% reduction in short-term rental listings points to a tremendous success. Yet by their own admission, this, progr this program has proven Thank largely speaker, ineffective that's your time. at stopping fraud. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yurka, and I'm calling about agenda item nine to urge you please to recommend designation of the Paul Revere Williams House as a historic cultural monument. Williams designed magnificent residences as well as commercial and institutional buildings across Los Angeles. The story this modest house tells of a brilliant path-breaking architect who built beautiful homes for his affluent clients but was forced by racist housing policies and practices to live in this house and neighborhood is as worth remembering through preservation of this building as is the preservation of any of his buildings in Los Angeles. It is very important to the story of Los Angeles. Thank you for your time. Thank you, speaker. Hi, this is Donald here in Los Angeles. I have several items I'd like to speak on. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number 10, number 11, and general comment. You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that uh, there's a, a little problem with the Department of Planning uh, number, agenda item number two, they're planning to use freeway property uh, to uh, uh, find out if they could use it for homeless encampments or whatnot. Uh, I own a lot of the freeways and a lot of the properties, a lot of the property along the freeways. Uh, it says there that there's uh, active stakeholder involvement. Uh, if that was the case, they would actually ask me to use the properties instead of trying to steal it from me. Uh, I'm concerned about item number three. I thank you for uh, the city council for taking an interest in uh, trying to recover those properties that are doing illegal rentals. Uh, I need you guys to look at LA Center Studios at Six and Bixel. Uh, they're doing internet real estate there. Uh, they, they pull a bunch of trailers in and out of there where they're doing internet real estate. I noticed they're working with Paramount, Universal, and Hathaway. That's for agenda item number three. Uh, there's a problem with them doing internet real estate. Uh, there's somebody they really need to be looked at over there at LA Center Studios. Um, and uh, as far as uh, agenda item number number five, uh, I noticed that there's a lot of turmoil about these properties in Venice. There's a lot of file corrections. I don't really know who owns the property but it seems to be people are transferring it around and the value's going up in large amounts. Uh, and uh, item number 11, I'm really concerned about Irwin One and the property at 6561 Franklin Avenue. It looks like they did a file correction and somebody sold it back and forth. I, I don't know uh, if that was one of my properties or not, but uh, there could be a problem with that. I'm having a problem. I don't know if this Irwin is the same one with the racetrack over by Irwindale. I don't know if that's the same Thank Irwin you, or not. That's your time. Uh, Hello, uh, my name is Bobby Kwan. Uh, I live in Lower Canyon and uh, I'm part of the Lower Canyon Association and uh, Valley Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council uh, uh, members. 
And um, I want to speak on item number three on the home sharing uh, program. Um, as a resident who was dealing with a lot of the uh, problematic and non-compliant uh, uh, home sharing uh, uh, houses around here, uh, when we reached out to the city planning department, they said that they only deal with uh, listings that are on Airbnb. But a lot, a lot of times, these um, problematic listings, you know, when they get into trouble, they get cited. They go to smaller, you know, less well-known uh, websites, you know, to advertise and their uh, short-term rental and continue to be, you know, huge party house issues, uh, you know, non-resident issue, a lot of problematic issues for the residents. We just need the, the city planning department to be able to de- work with other websites aside from Airbnb to do better enforcement because right now there's a huge loophole and that we really need your help to, to please close that loophole. Thank you, Speaker. You know, so that, That's your time. You know, those, those properties, uh, you will go to a small, smaller website. Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Ellen Evans, and I'm calling in on behalf of Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council. Is this the correct time for my comment? Correct. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? You have one minute. For na- neighborhood councils have one minute? We've submitted a CIS on this. Okay. Um, I thought we would get at least to two or three minutes. Our commit. we, I'm the chair of the ad hoc committee on home sharing and party house ordinances. Our committee was formed in 2019 to address pressing and widespread hillside concerns related to short-term rentals and legalization of short-term rentals by the city of Los Angeles. Um, The pressures that short-term rentals put on housing markets are well documented and have obvious impacts on the availability of housing and therefore homelessness. Our committee focused on neighborhood issues which were primarily safety, quality of life, and faith in government issues. Um, So uh, we we had a lot of questions that we talked about, um, and I was going to tell you what they were, but there's not time. Um, And then, so with each question, we sought to deepen our understanding. Finally, we submitted a list of proposed revisions to our neighborhood council, which they passed, and which we then presented to staff from the offices of our two council members. Um, we expanded our work to understand that regulation of short-term rentals is a global discussion, and many worldwide tourist destinations are grappling Thank you, with Speaker, it. That's your just time. as we're grappling. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is James Doherty, uh, and I live in Council District 13. Uh, today, I stand in favor of the motion. If it is amended, uh, the amendment consistent with the DCR report, uh, which includes critical language for a refiling process and safeguards against predatory practices. In addition, we also urge the committee to include additional amendments for supermajority voting protections, cooperative shares for equity applicants, and the ability for applicants to move to another community plan area. Let's do the right thing and prioritize social equity now, not later. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. This is Susan Winsberg, president of Franklin Quarter Communities. I'd like to speak on items number 8, 9, and 13, please. You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, I would like to wholeheartedly um, support the nominations of the Cultural Heritage Commission for the Eddie Rush Chester Anderson House and the Paul Revere Williams House um, to uh, get historic cultural monument status. Regarding um, agenda item 13, this is a this this uh, project needs to go through secret review. It should not be exempt. It's a very sensitive uh, property, a very sensitive area, and uh, the building as it's been planned right now would be very dangerous for the um, stakeholders. Um, many issues, uh, not not just the, the that it actually is in a very high fire uh, hazard severity zone. And it is on the Alquist Priolo um, uh, <clears throat> zone, 
but also um, they're planning this driveway that's going to be just feet from the intersection of Franklin and um, Whitley, and it will not only cause terrible backups in traffic at that light, but it will also be very dangerous if there ever were an emergency. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, um, <clears throat> the, the fact that there's no setbacks um, or very, very little setback, um, also creating this density in this sensitive zone is just totally dangerous and wrongheaded. Um, uh, they're planning a, a double height and a roof deck on a very steep hill, which will be um, at the same level as many people's bedroom windows because this is a steep hill. Um, so that's also going to be uh, causing a lot of noise pollution and lowering the quality of life for the, um, the whole neighborhood. So speaker, please grant this appeal. This, this, Hello, this is Will Wright with the Los Angeles chapter of the American Institute of Architects to share our support for item number nine for the uh, designation of the house that Paul Williams FAIA lived in. Thank you for your time and your leadership. You may begin. Caller with the number ending in 1656, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Yes. Have you called me? Yes, we can hear you, Speaker. Oh, Jim Childs for the North University Park Community Association for item number 9. I want to thank the Conservancy and Teresa Grimes for making this monument happen. And I want to thank the Cultural Heritage Commission for recognizing that there are important buildings besides buildings of architecture in our community. And I would ask this board to uh, approve the nomination for monument designation. And we will welcome it here in University Park to, s to sit alongside the Adlai Stevenson home, which is also a cultural monument. They're very important to have our culture recognized as well as our architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with an unidentified number, please press star six to unmute yourself. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy McCullough, and I'm a homeowner speaking in support of item number three. I have another homeowner from our block, Barbara Hervitz, whom I'm going to try to patch her in and take one minute myself and one minute for her. We have lived on a street that has had both permitted and unpermitted home sharing for two years. The program has not been a success in a word. We submitted written statements to this effect. The absence of the ability for neighbors to provide nuisance testimony to any hearing, adjudicating type of a board. The planning department thought LAPD was doing it. LAPD thought that building and safety was doing it. And at the end of the day, two years worth of permits have been renewed with no opportunity for homeowners to provide the seriously disruptive of disturbances 
underpower of people holding a city permit for home sharing. I appreciate all that our council member Perez has done to bring this motion to bear and put into the process a review and study opportunities to improve it. But I would like you all to think about a short term way that all people who are using. Thank you, Speaker. That's permit. your time. Right. And now I'm going to turn over. Caller with the number ending in 8876, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Yes, my name is Madison Shockley. I'm the treasurer of the Social Equity Owners and Workers Association. Uh, not sure what item number it is, but it's the cannabis motion. Uh, just want to express our, our gratitude and support for the items that were added in uh, to the motion that were recommended by the DCR. Uh, very helpful stuff for social equity. And, and just want to encourage uh, you all to include the remaining uh, two or three items uh, that were left up for uh, consideration later. Uh, among them, the ability to move between community plan areas. There are certain uh, community plan areas that may not be full uh, numbers wise, but they're full in terms of available properties. And there's several applicants, uh, that can't find properties and, and would be able to get their businesses open sooner if they had the ability to move around. Also, uh, super majority rules, uh, clo closing that loop loophole will go a long way in protecting our equity. Uh, and so, yes, but we're very uh, thankful and supportive of, of the inclusions in the motion so far. And thank you for working with the DCR. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm here to speak on item number nine. My name is Stephen Sand, calling from the Westwood community, calling to urge the committee to please support the nomination and the recommendation from the Cultural Heritage Commission on the Paul Revere Williams home. The fact that today is quite a reminder of the incredible importance of honoring not just our architecture, but the culture and the history of this city. The fact that this man was a giant in his field, he's left behind incredible monuments across the city and the fact that this was his very modest home underscores the need to recognize this property if you think about it across the country we honor places where george washington slept and other important figures and and it is very important that we we preserve this monument this home to remind us that from a very modest place greatness was created and greatness that has been the hallmark of black excellence in this city and i would urge your committee please to support this very worthy nomination. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Kika Keith. I am the president of the Social Equity Owners and Workers Association, as well as a resident and business owner of the first black woman-owned social equity retail dispensary in CD8. And though my doors are open after a three-year licensing process, there are more than 100 day three social equity applicants who are in desperate need of policy intervention to open their doors. We urge that you amend the motion consistent with the DCR report, which includes critical language for a refiling process and safeguards against predatory process practices. I must reiterate, this motion must be amended to be consistent with the DCR report to spark comprehensive social equity reform and restore optimism and hope to social equity applicants who have been swimming in the sea of sharks for the past four years. This is a much needed life jacket and as much as it's a great first step, it's critical that full resources be allocated to implement this motion with the DCR's report for real results. Thank you very much. Uh just uh, a brief interruption here. Uh, two things. Uh, one, we had a, a caller from the neighborhood council uh, who would submitted an impact statement who we only gave one minute. We need to give that person three minutes. 
So uh, if you are not on the line, if you could call back in. Secondly, we have about uh, 14 people in the queue. Uh, we're gonna close public comments. We're not gonna take any additional callers. And so with those three minutes and the 14 people on queue, we should be able to complete public comment within the next 20 minutes. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Kenyatta Bakir, and um, I live in Council District 11 in Playa del Rey. Um, I am a social equity applicant, um, and today I stand in favor of the motion <clears throat> if it is amended consistent with the DCR report, which will include critical language for a refouling process and safeguards against predatory practices. In addition, we also urge the committee to include additional amendments for supermajority voting protection, cooperative shares to equity applicants, and the ability for applicants to move to another community plan area. Um, please, let's do the right thing and prioritize social equity now, not later. Thank you for all of your um, hard work on this. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alfred Torregano. Um, I am a social equity entrepreneur and stakeholder in uh, district number three. I live in district three, but my business is in district 10. And um, I stand, I'm speaking on item number seven. Um, you know, I just want to uh, encourage and urge the council to really prioritize social equity now and not later, you know. Uh, I, I, I stand in favor of this motion if it is amended consistently with the DCR report to support the refiling process and the safeguards against predatory practices. I'm one of the individuals who've been preyed upon by some of these just greedy investors who do not want to uh, really operate within the spirit and intent of the true social equity program. So in addition, I want to urge the committee to, to uh, amend the, um, the, this report in a uh, motion to, to focus on these super majority loopholes that investors are, are, are favoring. Uh, also, uh, the opportunity for cooperative shares for equity applicants and Thank the you, ability Speaker, for us to time. move in another community plan. Thank you. Uh, for this opportunity to uh, give my comments again. Uh, my name is Ellen Evans and I'm speaking on behalf of the Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council. I chair our ad hoc committee on home sharing and party house ordinances. Um, our committee focused on neighborhood issues which were primarily safety, quality of life and faith in government issues. As we were initially meeting, our biggest concerns were how the city would handle apparently false claims of primary residency, how problem locations would be dealt with and how the provisions related specifically to very high fire hazard severity zones would be enforced. As the registration system came online and then as enforcement officially began, the questions and concerns grew and they grew because of observed nuisance activity, proliferation of non-compliant listings and apparent roadblocks in efforts and enforcement related to specific locations and specific websites. Some questions that came up repeatedly from neighbors and committee members were, why wasn't permit and fine information publicly available? What happens when people call the complaint line? And initially, why weren't fines being levied for the large number of non-compliant listings? And once fining did begin, why were fines being levied at a flat rate that would not impact operators in our area when the ordinance allows for larger fines? Why weren't short-term rental brokerage sites being fined when we could identify several with a large number of apparently non-compliant listings and when there was a clear provision for that in the ordinance? Um, how could we be certain that special provisions for rentals in very high fire hazard severity zones were being followed when there was no outside enforcement mechanism? And with each question, we sought to deepen our understanding of the nature and mechanisms of the system so we could seek appropriate solutions, which, as I said before, we submitted um, to our two council members and then um, began our understanding 
the, of regulation of short-term rentals as a global discussion. Many worldwide tourist destinations are grappling with it, just as we are grappling with it in Los Angeles. What's the best way to regulate short-term rentals in a way that allows neighborhoods to maintain a good degree of stability while providing a certain amount of freedom to property owners and residents? Some municipalities are on their second or third revision of their rules. Some municipalities have ways for neighbors to peti petition for permit revocation. Some inspect short-term rentals. Some require hosts to be available to solve problems 24-7. There are good ideas out there, and we presented our favorites in our CIS, which is to say um, that there are, nothing should be stopping good information and good ideas from being good, put to use here in our own good city. Beller Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council wholeheartedly supports this motion and thanks council members Raman and Koretz for working with their colleagues to bring this motion to council. Thank you, and we urge swift passage of this motion and ultimate adoption of fair and effective enforcement measures. Let's have Los Angeles be the gold standard for regulation and not leave neighborhoods out in the cold. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. Hello, my name is Shelley Kaya, and I'm a 25-year resident of Whitley Heights. We will be greatly affected, by the way, I'm speaking on item 13, number 21-0627. We will be greatly affected by this project, and it should not be CEQA exempt. TOC notwithstanding, it's being built in a high fire severity zone, compounded with the fact that it's on a fault line. No allowance should be granted for increased density, setbacks, nor height restrictions. The planned rooftop terrace will mean a diminished quality of life for all residents, existing and new. No site-specific design review has been done, and this is a very sensitive location. The ingress and egress is designed very near an F-rated intersection, making evacuation during an emergency a truly life-threatening situation. Please, a secret CEQA review is definitely necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Hello. Um, my name is Tyrone Sesson, and I'm a resident of District 37, and I want to speak on agenda item number seven. As a social equity advocate, I am requesting that you support the DCR's report recommendations, which include amendments for a refiling process, and um, also it, um, include safeguards against predatory practices. I think it's very important that you prioritize these recommendations by the DCR because it helps true social equity applicants and advocates like myself. Um, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with the number ending in 5065, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, it's Donald here in Los Angeles. Uh, I was a little concerned about the uh, Department of uh, Planning use of freeway property uh, and uh, that the uh, agenda item number 2, uh, I thought that uh, if there was active stakeholder involvement, you'd be asking the owner of the property if he wants homeless people on his land or not. Uh, probably not. Uh, uh, my property assessor code is O, zero. I own a lot of the property along the freeways. Uh, I don't want the uh, city trying to build stuff and claim more of my property than they already have. They haven't even paid me for the stuff that they're claiming. Uh, I have there's several pieces of property that the city of Los Angeles is trying to claim that they haven't paid me for yet. Uh, I don't want them trying to build homeless camps on my property. Uh, it's kind of insulting, actually. Uh, 
Uh, you know, it would be. It would. I, I'm sorry. I don't Thank mean to be mean time. to you guys, the city council. It's just uh, I'm having a bad time with. Caller with the number ending in 6801, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Lewis Harris, and I'm calling uh, for uh, agenda item number 7. Yes, you have one minute. I'm a member. Thank you. Uh, I'm a member of the Social Equity Owners and Workers Association equity applicant. I live in District 10. My application is in District 9. And I wanted to uh, thank uh, the council for uh, uh, amending, I hope you amend it in consistent with DCR's report uh, to include the critical language for refiling process and safeguards against priority practices. Uh, we're thankful that uh, finally it looks like the DCR and the city council are moving forward uh, together collectively Thank to you, try Speaker. to do That's what's your time. best. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Speaker. Okay, hi. My name is Stephanie Savage. I'm with the Laurel Canyon Association and the Bel Air Beverly Trust Neighborhood Council. I'm speaking on item three, um, and I uh, want the uh, council to seriously consider the enforcement of home sharing properties in the very high fire severity zone on concerns of non compliance. Specifically, uh, the LAFD must verify that brush clearance has occurred recently or ever on the subject property and that the LADBS must do physical checks to verify that the portion of the home being shared ever had a certificate of occupancy. Check if the property has any available parking on site in the event that the garage is being home shared. Verify some that there are smoke detectors or non-smoking signs that were required in the original ordinance. Uh, home sharing licenses should not be given or renewed without these basic safety checks in the very high fire severity zone. Uh, these safety checks will save lives of stakeholders and people home sharing, and it's easy. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Hi, my name is Amir Gresham. I am a long-standing member of the Council District 8, and I'll be speaking on item number 7. I'm a Phase 3 retail round 1 applicant, as well as a Phase 2 business owner. And I call in it today to uh, reiterate some of the points that were made by other social equity applicants, as well as business owners. I want to state that I stand in favor of the motion, only if it's amended to be consistent with the DCR report which includes critical language for the refiling process and safeguards against predatory practices. In addition, I, like all the other applicants, urge the committee to include additional amendments for supermajority voting protection, cooperative shares for equity applicants, and the ability for applicants to move to another community plan if necessary. It is imperative that you do the right thing by prioritizing social equity now and not later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with the number ending in 0816, please press star 6 to unmute yourself.
caller with the number ending in 0816. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Speaker. This is Jean Frost speaking on behalf of the Empowerment Congress North Area Neighborhood Development Council, DANDEC, on items 4 and 9 for which we submitted CIS statements. I wanted to know how much time I would have. You have three minutes, caller. Thank you. Um, first, uh, the Neighborhood Council is in support of item 4 conditionally. Uh, we had extensive meetings with uh, Dwayne Gathers and Alfred Frejo. We will support it, provided the RD 1.5 underlying residential zoning is preserved in any future development, and also that the lot be used exclusively for the AAA because it is an interior lot um, and, the, uh, and should not be used for uh, other extensive parking uses. Secondly, we strongly support the nomination of the Paul Williams House. It is critically important to understand part of Los Angeles history, um, a prominent and leading architect who would be designing homes in Bel Air and expensive neighborhoods, yet because of covenants could not live in the neighborhoods in which he was a prominent architect and did great work. So we urge you to support for, to support item nine. It's a very important element to the cultural and architectural, well, not necessarily architecture, but cultural heritage of the Nandek area. And also, uh, personally, not on behalf of the council, I would like to say uh, this is Jean Frost, neighborhood resident of uh, Council District 1. I would like to support also the scholarship and nomination for item number eight. Thank you very much. Uh, please vote in favor of four, eight, and nine. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Speaker. Hello. Hi, I'd like to speak on the general comment and also on item number five. Hello? We can hear you, Speaker. Hello? Okay, all right. Uh, I want you, I, I'd like you to come uh, with serious, serious to start taking it into consideration uh, when, you, when projects would come up have to do with taxpayer money. Uh, it's not plain money, uh, and sometimes I feel like it's irresponsible uh, that taxpayers are not given a voice when it comes to nonprofits. Uh, we feel as though we have a gun to our heads because if we don't pay up, then, uh, then it, 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 uh, we lose our land. And I don't think that's right. I think it has to be seriously considered the how, the when, the why, the sequel, et cetera. That's, that's my general comment. Uh, and then the second thing is on the plum hearing on item number five. It, it, it is about size, scale, character, and architecture. And it also is about a nonprofit that's taking advantage of them. They want to build at about a million dollars per unit to 750 square feet. Again, this relates to taxpayer money. We're dealing with a council person that has already basically uh, been thrown out because he got so many, he didn't get the full recall, but he was basically recalled because over 29,000 people voted to recall him because of his policy. And I hope that people look onto him and other council people do as well and realize that we're tired of the dystopia that's being created around all of Los Angeles and that they've taken into consideration that they might be next because people are fed up with all the blight around the entire city and building in Venice, the tourist uh, area, but for all of Los Angeles, the main beach is going to be ruined if this goes through. Uh, please vote against it. Thank you.
Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Speaker. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm calling in support of item number seven. Uh, my name is Javier Montez. I'm the vice chair of the United Cannabis Business Trade Association. We're the leading voice for legal retail cannabis in the state and partner with cannabis cultivators, manufacturers, and distributors to protect and enhance the vitality of our industry. We support this item and thank council members Harris Dawson and Price for the continued leadership. We're moving in the right direction and we're hopefully hopeful that these changes will yield positive results for our industry. We also thank the DCR for working collaboratively in this process. Uh, important, important changes need to be made to streamline the process and provide relief to social equity candidates. And this can only be accomplished if DCR is at the table. We look forward to continuing to work with the city on other important changes that still need to be made, like those relating to relocation provisions. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And that concludes the time allotted for public comment. All right, thank you to everybody who called in and participated in our uh, public uh, comment availability uh, on the various items that we have there. Uh, there is, uh, Mr. Mejia, a request to continue item number one until a date to be determined. Duly noted. Excellent, all right. And then uh, the... Uh, as chair, I am uh, asking that we adopt item number four. I'm sorry, item number two, item number two in district Second. four. Uh, on consent, it's been seconded by Mr. Cedillo. Duly noted. Uh, that takes us to item number three, Ramen, Blumenfeld, Bonin, Caretz, and De Leon. Yes, uh, this is a motion, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, instructing various departments to prepare a report in 90 days relative to unpermitted and non-compliant home sharing operations in the city. We heard uh, several callers uh, from various neighborhoods call in on this item. Um, and uh, if there's no objection, we'll also take this item on consent. Very good. Seeing no objection, that'll be the order. And then, uh, Mr. Mejia, items number four and five, you could read those into the uh, record, uh, recommending that those items be taken on consent as well. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, committee members, item four is a mitigated negative deck, uh, the related CEQA findings a report from the Planning Commission for a general plan amendment and a zone change from restricted density multiple dwelling zone to the commercial zone to replace an existing surface parking lot with a five level parking structure located in CD9. The recommendation is to approve the environmental clearance, the mitigated negative deck, the general plan amendment resolution, the zone and height change ordinance as reflected in the letter, in the corrected letter of determination dated January 27, 2022. Item five is a motion Bon and Ramen. It's uh, asking the council to rescind an earlier action as it relates to a resolution to amend the Venice Community Plan to correct errors in the exhibits that were attached to the resolution which did not include the complete set of maps. The recommendation therein is to adopt the motion, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members. I will call the roll. Uh, Council member Marquise Harris Dawson. Yes. Council member Gilbert Cedillo. Yes. Council member Bob Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council member John Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. Excellent, that takes us to item number six. Item six uh, is a communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Mr. Steve Kang to the Central Area Planning Commission for the term ending June 30th, 2022. All right, uh, Mr. Kang, if you're on the line, now is the time to come forward. Good afternoon, council member. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kang. If you could just, uh, in a sh short amount of time, 
tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you have uh, interest in serving the city in this capacity and what you hope to accomplish on behalf of uh, your fellow Angelinos. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. First, I want to wish everyone a happy Lunar New Year and happy Black History Month. I also want to thank the committee chair, Councilmember Marquise Harris Dawson, along with all the other committee members for the invitation to address this body. So let me first start off by saying I'm honored to be considered to serve on the Central LA Area Planning Commission. And as a member of the greater Koreatown community and the central area of our city, I have engaged in various community planning initiatives that make lasting impacts in our neighborhood. And as a director at KYCC, which stands for Koreatown Youth and Community Center, and I've had the pleasure of working with many of you and your offices on various projects, which we greatly appreciate. Um, I, I believe that I have the extensive experience working with the community, the stakeholders on issues ranging from affordable housing to homelessness to youth services. And lastly, Koreatown and the central area is one of the most densely populated, populated areas in our city. And I believe that we need representatives on the commission to provide recommendations with not only lived experience, but with the extensive understanding of the diversity for each community and neighborhood as well. So thank you all for your consideration. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Um, I've known um, Mr. Kang for many, many years and uh, you will not find someone who's more dedicated to, to serving the city. Uh, he's someone who's been involved with a lot of different nonprofits uh, and has really shown a care for um, of what the city does and how it progresses and, and someone who has an understanding of, of planning and how it relates to our city. So I uh, urge you to uh, accept this and uh, urge an I vote for Mr. King. All right, it's, uh, it's been moved by Mr. Lee seconded by the chair. There's no other comments. Uh, Mr. Mejia, you can call the roll. Uh, yes, council member Marquise Harris Dawson. Yes. Council member Cedillo. Yes. Council member Bob Blumenfield. I feel that. Council member Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's uh, five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kang, soon to be commissioner. Uh, that takes us to item number seven. Item seven, uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, is a motion Harris Dawson Price instructing the Department of Cannabis Regulation to implement cannabis licensing changes to increase speed and equity in the process. And also, um, it includes instructions that were inadvertently omitted from a prior motion. In a report from the Cannabis Regulation Department, its most recent report dated January 27th, 2022, which includes an interim budget request for the proposed amendment to the, muni to the municipal code relative to cannabis license application processes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mejia. So uh, members, what we have before us today is um, the correct version of the long awaited uh, cannabis regulation motion uh, that is designed to streamline some things and provide some certainty for social equity applicants who've uh, been suffering mightily under the weight of uh, the bureaucratic uh, confusion that we've had on our part at the city. And so uh, what we have before you is essentially a page was missing from the original transmission. Uh, so I'll ask for your I votes today to uh, send this from this committee to the uh, budget committee. Is there uh, any questions or discussion members? All right. Uh, seeing none, uh, Mr. Mejia, I'll uh, request a second. And when we have a second, uh, I'll second. call the roll. Second. second it by the uh, yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, will you be um, reading into the record the various recommendations at this time or later? 
I, I'm certainly hopeful that you will read those recommendations into the record at this okay. time. Okay, <laughs> I will. I will read them now, if that's yeah. okay. Uh, okay. I will be. I will begin. Um, recommendation one to adopt the January 18, 2020, 2022 motion, Harris Dawson Price, to include the draft proposal instructions to implement cannabis licensing changes to increase speed and equity in the process inadvertently omitted and which are consistent with the recommendations contained in the January 27, 2022 Department of Cannabis Regulation Report, attachment two. Number two, approve the recommendations contained in the January 27, 2022 Department of Cannabis Regulation Report denoted as attachment one, and instruct the CAO, the city administrative officer, to prepare a report relative to the Department of Cannabis Regulation request of 21 position authorities in the Department of Cannabis Regulation, recommendation number one, three positions in the office of the city attorney, recommendation two, and two positions in the office of finance, recommendation three, to ensure that they will be entirely grant funded consistent with the acceptance of 22,312,360 from the state of California Department of Cannabis Control as denoted in council file 220026 and that there is no impact on the general fund. Uh, number three, receive and file the Department of Cannabis Regulation reports dated October 29, 2021 and November 16, 2021, and the December 6, 2021 report from the Cannabis Regulation Commission, in as much as those reports and recommendations are superseded by the Department of Cannabis Regulation report dated January 27, 2022. And number four, request the city attorney with the assistance of the Department of Cannabis Regulation to prepare and present an ordinance as contained in the January 27, 2022 Department of Cannabis Regulation, attachment two, report to address application processing delays, clarify application processes, and meet the mandates associated with the city's licensing and social equity program and the state's new annual licensure deadlines. In addition, the two amendments that were read into the record at the beginning of this meeting by the chairman of this committee. That concludes the recommendations, Mr. Chair. All right, I believe we can call the roll. Yes, uh, Council Member Marquis Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Gilbert Cedillo. Yes. Council Member Bob Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council Member John Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, that takes us to item number eight. Item eight is a categorical exemption from CEQA and a report from the Cultural Heritage Commission relative to the inclusion of the Eddie Rochester Anderson House as a historic cultural monument. Properties located in CD8. All right. Uh, we have a report from Department of City Planning. Yes, good afternoon, Chairman Harris Dawson and members of the committee, Lambert Singer with City Planning. The recommendation from the Cultural Heritage Commission is to designate the property as an historic cultural monument with the finding that the property is associated with the lives of historic personages important to national, state, city, and local history as the longtime home of African-American actor and comedian Eddie Rochester Anderson. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you so much. Do we have any comments from our uh, applicant, Ms. Grimes? Or any comments from the uh, owner or family of the owner? Uh, hello, Teresa Grimes. Uh, I prepared the application for the property owner, who is the son of the original owner, Eddie Rochester Anderson. The property owner is indeed in support. The Anderson House was also listed in the National Register in 2020, and as a result, it was included in the California Register. 
Monument designation will add another level of recognition and protection for this important property. Um, um, uh, Anderson was a radio, film, and television star who played a prominent role in early entertainment industry. He expressed his success through the construction of this grand house where he lived from 1940 until his death in 1977. It's minimally altered and retains all aspects of integrity. I encourage you to approve the staff report and recommend the monument designation of the property to the full city council. Happy um, Black History Month. Um, I think this would be an excellent way of celebrating it. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Grimes and everybody uh, who participated in this application and uh, our, our staff in the Department of City Planning as well as the Council District 8 staff. Uh, it's a great way to begin uh, the first uh, uh, first day of uh, Black History Month. Um, uh, certainly uh, recognizing that this home was uh, had the architect, Mr. Paul Revere Williams, um, who is a noted architect who oftentimes isn't the architect of record, uh, including at the airport theme museum, uh, because at that time, uh, the architect of, of record uh, was either not allowed or highly discouraged from, the, from um, being an African-American uh, person. Uh, this uh, neighborhood, the Sugar Hill neighborhood, was home to uh, several Paul Williams' work uh, and to several early Hollywood uh, celebrities. Uh, Mr. Uh, Eddie Rochester uh, Anderson, I will confess to have having heard of Rochester, but I don't think I ever saw uh, him on television or heard him on the radio. There might be uh, members of the committee, <clears throat> Council District 1, that might have uh, been able to check out Rochester in his day, uh, but clearly a, a widely recognized uh, figure in the uh, entertainment industry. Not in person, uh, Mr. Chair, but uh, I enjoyed uh, the afternoon uh, Jack Benny show with uh, Mr. Rochester. Excellent. I knew you, you would come through for me. You always do. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. And so I will move and I'll ask Mr. Uh, Cedillo for a second that we approve the inclusion of this Eddie Rochester house. Second. Uh, excellent. It's been seconded and moved. Uh, Mr. Mejia, can you call the roll? Uh, yes. Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Cedillo. Uh, yes. Council Member Bob Blumenfield. I. Council Member Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. Excellent. Uh, we have uh, now, uh, Mr. Mejia, item number nine. Item nine is a categorical exemption from CEQA, the report from the Cultural Heritage Commission, relative to the inclusion of the Paul Revere Williams House, uh, located in CD8, in the list of historic cultural monuments. All right, uh, we have another report from uh, Department of City Planning. Yes, thank you, Chairman Harris Dawson. The recommendation from the Cultural Heritage Commission is to designate this property as an historic monument for its important association with Paul Revere Williams. It was his uh, first house here in Los Angeles. Uh, all right, do we have any uh, comments by the applicant or the owner? I believe the applicant was going to speak. Adrian Scott. Yes, Adrian Scott Fine, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Good afternoon, Council Members. It's Scott Fine with the Los Angeles Conservancy. The Conservancy is very pleased to bring this historic cultural monument nomination to you today and thanks Teresa Grimes for its preparation. You may have seen there is tremendous community support for, support for this place and to see it recognized and protected. As the personal residence for architect Paul Revere Williams for 30 years, this modest house is fundamental in telling the full story about him, his family, and understanding his life and the limitations imposed upon him as a result of redlining the racial housing covenants at the time. As LA's hometown and celebrated black architect, Williams achieved many great things while living in this simple bungalow. He shared his personal experiences and wrote about this house, which influenced his work and life. The Conservancy is committed to ensuring this house is preserved for the future and the broader 
University of Paul Revere Williams as an inspiration for others. Thank you to Councilman Harris Dawson and your staff. Please support this HCM nomination. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, are there uh, questions or comments from the committee on this item? Uh, Sting on, I just want to read it. Long overdue, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Mr. Cedillo. Uh, yes, it's a, a great way to uh, kick off Black History Month, uh, given that uh, our audit that showed that so many of our, so few of our uh, HCMs are dedicated to the, the history of, of African-Americans in the city. I'll read a quote from Mr. Paul Williams into the record. Today, I sketched the preliminary plans for a large country house, which will be erected in one of the most beautiful residential districts in all the world. Sometimes I have dreamed of living there. I could afford such a home, but this evening I returned to my own small inexpensive home in a comparatively undesirable section of Los Angeles. I must always live in that locality or in another like it because I am a Negro. And so uh, we see uh, the legacy of Paul Williams, you know, designed many of the houses in Bel Air and Brentwood and uh, could not live there uh, because of uh, racial uh, covenants. And uh, we recognize his work, but we also recognize his struggle uh, for a more just and equitable society. And with that, I'll ask for a second and ask for Mr. McGee to call the roll. Second. I'd be honored second to second, second that. Thank you. I will call the roll. Council member Marquise Harris Dawson. Yes. Council member Gilbert Cedillo. Yes. Council member Bob Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council member John Lee. Aye. And councilwoman Monica Rodriguez. Aye. By members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. All right, that takes us to item number 10. Yes, item 10 is a statutory exemption from CEQA and the related environmental findings, a report from the South Valley Area Planning Commission and an appeal by M Mitchell Tsai, uh, representing the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters for the determination of the South Valley APC approval of the environmental clearance for the construction of a two-phase mixed-use building and commercial building situated in CD3. Excellent. I will ask uh, uh, the Department of City Planning for their report. Good afternoon, Sheila Tony from the Planning Department. Before you is a CEQA appeal of a statutory exception from CEQA pursuant to California Public Resource Code 21155.4 related to a mixed use development. This is one of two environmental clearances issued for the project. The other is tiering from the Warner Center Plan Program EIR per CEQA section 15168 and 15162 that is not further appealable. Only the statutory exemption is before you. The project consists of a demolition of an approximately 41,000 square foot office building for construction of a 22 story commercial office tower and a seven-story mixed-use building consisting of 190 multifamily residential units, four work-live units, and eight hotel units with ground floor com uh, commercial, retail, and restaurant. The basis of the appeal pertains to allegations that the project is inconsistent with the Warner Center plan and therefore is inconsistent with the program EIR. To provide some context, the appeal points are identical to the appeal points raised in the first level administrative appeal of the director's determination, which was considered and acted upon by the South Valley Area Planning Commission after their September 10, 2020 public hearing, excuse me, at their public hearing. And at this meeting, the commission denied the appeal and sustained the planning director's determination by adopting the conditions of approval a technical modification to two conditions, adding clarifying language and findings. The appeal lacks credibility and makes inaccurate assumptions, facts, and analysis pertaining to the project. As such, a full response to the appeal and staff's recommendation are posted on the council file. And so for these reasons, staff recommends that the city council deny the appeal in full and sustain the South Valley Area Planning Commission's decision 
determined based on the whole of the administrative record that the project is exempt from CEQA pursuant to Public Resource Code 21155.4 and find that none of the circumstances in Public Resource Code Section 21166 have occurred and therefore no further environmental review shall be conducted. Lastly, uh, staff also recommends adopting revised environmental findings to reflect the Commission's action at their September 10th, 2020 public hearing that the project is statutorily exempt from CEQA. And so toward that end, the director's initial finding that the project is covered within the Warner Center plan program EIR remains the same. Thank you. I'm available for questions. All right. Um, we have an appellant uh, for three minutes or less. Good afternoon, counselors. My name is Mitchell M. Ty, speaking on behalf of the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters, speaking in support of the appeal filed by the Carpenters from the determination of the South Valley Area Planning Commission in approving a statutory exemption as environmental clearance for the proposed project for the 21300 project under the Warner Center 2035 plan and the Canoga Park, Winnetka, Woodland Hills, West Hills Community um, Plan. My project believes that the project should not be statutorily exempted from CEQA under 21155.4 of the Public Resources Code as the project is inconsistent with both the Warner Center and Canoga Park specific plan. Section 21155.4 of the Public Resources Code requires that a project be consistent with a specific plan for which an environmental impact report has been certified um, in order to be eligible for the statutory exemption that is before you today. However, for a number of reasons, the project is not consistent with the Warner Center 2035 and Canoga Park on um, specific plan. First of all, the project fails to provide any affordable housing in violation of the Canoga Park Winnetka Woodland Hills West Hills Community Plan requirement that the project provide a diversity of housing choices accessible to a wide range of the city's um, economic, uh, you know, economic stakeholders. In addition, the project ignores, entirely neglects over 130 environmental mitigation measures required by the Warner Center 2035 plan. While the municipal code only requires that the city apply all physically feasible mitigation measures to the project. The city instead excludes a large number of the applicable mitigation measures on the unsubstantiated claim that the currently applicable regulations rendered environmental mitigation measures unnecessary. However, those findings are not permitted under either the LA Municipal Code, CEQA, and unsupported by substantial evidence. In addition to that, the technical modifications made by the South Valley Area Planning Commission also similarly rendered the project inconsistent with the Warner Center 2035 plan. In particular, they removed requirements that the project pay um, mobility fees um, under the um, part by the chart that to be paid to the city of Los Angeles of approximately uh, um, of a specific amount. Instead, the city, um, the South Valley Area Planning Commission uh, modified conditions of approval to apply the 2019 mobility fee table um, rather than the currently applicable 2020 mobility fee table. This violates section 7.3.1 of the Warner Center 2035 plan, which specifically states that the Warner, that the mobility fee rates will be assessed at the time of building permit issuance, um, which this project is far from having its building permits issued at this time. In addition, the South Valley Area Planning Commission removed the condition approval requiring the developer pay a total of $1,982,000 to the um, city in terms of cultural amenity fees. Instead, indicating that the payment of such cultural amenity fees shall be paid if the valuation of the project building permit That's half your time. a million Thank or you, more. Si. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you so much. It's uh, my understanding that we uh, don't have an applicant on the line, so we'll begin our deliberation of this item uh, by uh, ceding the floor to Mr. Blumenfeld. Thank you. Um, colleagues, this project's been around and around for a very long time in my district, has gone through 
uh, quite a lot. Now, one of the things that was raised, and, and, I, and I'm, you know, I work very closely with the carpenters and, uh, you know, really try to engage with them. And I want to see them working on all the projects should be using skilled labor in the district. But one of the things that was raised, um, although I didn't hear the, the, the applicant raise it right here, was the question of notice. And I wanted to get on the record. Was this uh, appeal uh, properly noticed? Uh, how long has it been since the appeal was filed? Good afternoon. Uh, the notice of public hearing was released at least 10 days prior to uh, today, which is January 21st, 2022, and uploaded to the council file and mailed out via U.S. Postal Service mail to the applicant, appellant, and interested parties. Okay. I just wanted to get that clear because we always want to make sure we're giving everyone proper notice. The big question here deals with the sequest question. Um, I mean, there's a lot of issues involved in this, but I know we're focused. We, we're, we're limited in what we can focus on. But is there a way to hear the CEQA appeal for this project that is separate from the Warner Center specific plan without actually undermining the previous approvals made for projects in the Warner Center specific area? Because just for my colleagues, the Warner Center specific area, we have one big EIR for all of the projects and then uh, the projects within it uh, are, you know, often are able to use that that EIR. And so, when projects like this come up, where there's a question on the CEQA, um, you know, what I want to know is: is there a way for us to even look at that without um, without basically undermining all of the all of the uh, the bigger EIR that that undergirds all of these projects that are already in in motion? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, no, uh, because the statutory exemption relates directly to the Warner Center specific plan, which has a certified program environmental impact report. Um, if this appeal gets approved, then it would possibly undermine all other projects that have been approved under the EIR. Um, the project before you today is located within the, the Warner Center specific plan area and both uh, it implements and is consistent with the Warner Center specific plan regulations. The statutory exemption is related to a mixed use development that implements and is consistent with a specific plan with an EIR that has been certified and therefore there are no grounds to uh, grant the appeal. Yeah, and that's, that is the, that's obviously the, the biggest nut to crack, which is one I don't think we can crack because it, it impacts so much more than one project. Um, so lastly, I wanted to ask about, you know, labor. I, I, I'm always trying to work to create PLAs in the area, to create, uh, requirements to use skilled labor. Um, is there any way to require skilled labor, uh, for this project? Uh, again, thank you for the, the question of, no, the Warner Center specific plan does not require a union labor for development projects. Okay. Thank you. That, that's it. So do we have a motion, Mr. Blumenfield? Uh, the, the, given the answers that we have, I have to move to deny the appeal. Excellent. Okay, I'll second that uh, motion. Uh, if, there are no, if there's no further discussion, uh, Mr. Mejia can call the roll. Uh, yes. Council member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council member Gilbert Cedillo. Yes. Council member Blumenfield. Aye. Council member Lee. Aye. And council Juan Rodriguez. Aye. That's uh, five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. Excellent. That takes us to item number 11. Item 11 is a, uh, categorical exemption from CEQA, the related environmental findings a report from the East Los Angeles Area Planning Commission and an appeal filed by David Wheatley for the determination of the East LA APC recommending approval of the environmental clearance in conjunction with a 920 square foot coffee shop with 40 seats located in CD4. All right, uh, Department of City Planning. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Christina Toyley with the Department of City Planning. 
The item before you is only the environmental and the appeal is the category exemption within the Silver Lake Echo Park Elysian Valley Community Plan area. In July 2021, as a zoning administrator, I approved the conditional use to allow the sale and dispensing of beer only for on-site consumption in conjunction with the proposed coffee shop and determined that the project is exempt from CEQA. The agreed party subsequently appealed the decision and at the September 22nd, 2021 hearing, the East Los Angeles Area Planning Commission denied the appeal and sustained the zoning administrator's decision and determined that the project is exempt from CEQA pursuant to section 15301 class one. Subsequently, the CEQA appeal before you today was filed. The appellant's appeal point related to CEQA are that it doesn't qualify for an exemption under CEQA. The appellant references numerous CEQA case laws and a reference to impacts, alternatives, mitigation measures, adequacy, noticing, challenges, and substantial changes, all related to EIRs. Here, the appellant has not met its burden of proof and there's no evidence in the record to conclude that the project does not qualify for an exemption. The other, appeal, um, the other appeal points are not related to CEQA and were mainly the same appeal points raised during the East Los Angeles Area Planning Commission hearing and are related to the improper notice of public hearing, traffic, and LAUSD correspondence, sensitive uses, and the administrative record. As stated at the East LA APC, the noticing included the 500-foot radius in accordance with the Los Angeles Municipal Code, uh, the 920-square-foot uh, 20, coffee shop, did not require a traffic study for a DOT threshold. The LAUSD letter was regarding outdoor seating and construction impact, and there are no outdoor seating proposed and only involves tenant improvements. And lastly, the case was available for review at our records management with a complete administrative record. That includes my presentation and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. All right, uh, do you have anything from the appellant? Yes, please. We can hear you. Uh, please. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for, my name is David Wheatley and I live in the Silver Lake area, about a block or so from the site. I appreciate the opportunity to make my appeal. Uh, I'm hearing an echo on here. Um, I looked into the uh, EPA from 1969, it was a federal law to protect the environment. In California, presumably in 1970, says, well, that law is not tough enough. We need a tougher one, so we got CEQA. It originally started out to uh, deal with government big projects. Presumably our go for a government wanted to put in big projects and sometimes would uh, bulldoze over things that made the people mad. And so these projects gradually became, um, here, hold on a second, please, I'm sorry private projects, large ones, and then work their way down to small projects such as this. And then there was a concern that people were slowing down, activists were slowing down small projects by complaining about snail darters and spotted owls, God bless them. And so the legislature set up some exemptions of projects that were considered too small to be governed by CEQA. And that's what this one is. Um, this project is basically, so there are two main things that I've come across in CEQA. One is that it provides for the fullest protection of the environment possible subject to the rules. And the other one that's come up uh, in 1990 case, Citizens versus uh, Goleta Valley, Citizens of Goleta Valley versus the Board of Supervisors says that the government agency, which is city planning here or the city or even this uh, organization here that where we're talking today, must truthfully inform the public. The public has not been truthfully informed on this project. The uh, hearing notices that were sent out omitted entirely the existence of Ivanhoe Elementary School, which is directly across the street from this place, maybe 30, 40 feet across the road. It was left out entirely these notices were sent out to over 300 people incorrectly. And then again, the same notice with the same deficient map was sent out to another 300 or maybe the same 300. It was also published in the paper and it was posted on the site. This is one of the main things that people in the Silver Lake area used to decide location. Trader Joe's on Hyperion 
in Ivanhoe Elementary on Rowena, or on Herkimer technically, but at the corner of Rowena, right across the street. And because the public in the broadest possible sense was not informed as to the role that CEQA could play, whether the city planning thinks it's, thinks it's exempt or not, Thank you, Mr. it's not really That's up your to time. them. Hello, this is uh, right, Manny Diaz on behalf of the applicant. Yes, hi, this is Manny Diaz from FE Design. I am uh, the applicant's representative. Uh, how are you today? Um, the applicants are longtime community stakeholders. They own multiple businesses in Silver Lake, including a salon, which is actually located on this property. Um, so they've been active parts of this community for over 10 years, and it's really one of their dreams to open up this cafe that serves coffee, sandwiches, pastries, and, and craft beer. So, we presented this project to the Land Use Committee of the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council. We notified everyone within 500 feet that we were going to this council meeting. We received an approval from them. We received another approval from the general board. We have a approval from the LAPD, the Office of Zoning Administration, the Planning Commission have all supported it. Um, the cafe itself is allowed by right in the zone. Building and safety has already issued construction documents for this. There's no addition of floor area. It's really just a 920 square foot uh, tenant improvement. It, it meets all zoning, building and health codes. So the issue today is just whether environmental impacts arise from a beer license. But in the state of California, no entity, no municipality requires anything resembling an EIR for someone to sell beer at a buy right cafe. And that's precisely because there's existing processes and procedures in place that mitigate those impacts. The zoning code, the building code, the zoning administrator's 28 conditions, they all accomplish this, this, uh, uh, this end. Um, uh, this stretch of arena, it's a great little eclectic neighborhood. There's retail stores, the school is there, but there's also offices, a spa, there's other restaurants. Uh, it really does fit in well with this neighborhood. Um, you know, there's no dancing, no live entertainment. There's no outdoor seating, right? There's no, you know, that, that just doesn't happen here. It's really just a small cafe with a beer license. Um, anybody within 500 feet of this premises knows exactly where Ivanhoe is. Everybody in the neighborhood knows. Uh, it's obvious, right? If you get this letter, you're within 500 feet. Um, so I just don't feel like that's an issue. So once again, uh, thank you for my for my time here, or for your time here, sorry. And uh, uh, yeah, we ask you to deny this appeal. Thank you. Thank you will now, thank you. We'll now hear from the uh, applicant. All right, with no applicant, we'll hear from a uh, representative from the council district. Council member Adrian Corsani, city attorney's office, just for the record, I believe that was the applicant who last spoke. So we did hear from both the appellant and the applicant on this matter. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, council members. My name is Michelle Majid, planning director for council member Nithya Rahman of the fourth district. We respectfully recommend that the committee sustain the zoning administrator's original approval and deny the appeal on the basis of lack of substantial evidence. Um, as mentioned by the applicant, they have provided support and non-opposition statements from the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council, LAPD, and members of the community. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will uh, move the uh, council office's recommendation. Is there a second? Okay. Second. Second by Mr. Cedillo. Uh, Mr. Mejia, can you uh, read the specific instructions into the record and call the roll? Okay. Uh, the recommendation is to deny the appeal filed by David Wheatley and thereby sustain the determination of the East LA Area Planning Commission in approving the environmental clearance, a categorical exception from CEQA, in conjunction with a 920 square foot coffee shop for the property located at 2894 through 96 West Rowena Avenue and as stated for the record by the representative of CD4 at today's meeting and by city planner, Christina Toy. I will call the roll. Uh, Council member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council member Gilbert Cedillo. Yes. Council member Bob Blumenfield. Aye. 
Council Member John Lee, absent, and Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's four members and it carries, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that takes us to item number 12. Item 12 is a categorical exemption from CEQA and the related environmental findings. Report from the Central Area Planning Commission and an appeal by David Wheatley challenging the determination of the Central APC in approving the environmental clearance for the approval of a vesting track map for a small lot subdivision uh, that will include uh, five small lots located in CD4. All right, uh, we have a report from the Department of City Planning. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Danilyn Dominguez with the Department of City Planning. The item before the committee today concerns a vesting tentative track map for a small lot subdivision of one 8,295.2 square foot site into five small lots per the small lot subdivision ordinance and one accessory dwelling unit located at 282 North Avenue Street. On July 28, 2021, the advisory agency approved the tentative track case to permit the five small lot subdivision and adopted categorical exemption number ENV-2019-4140-CE as the environmental clearance. On August 2021, the Department of City Planning received one appeal from the project from David Wheatley. On October 12, 2021, the Central Area Planning Commission, following its consideration of the material and oral testimony, denied the appeal and sustained the advisory agency's determination. On October 21st, 2021, David Wheatley filed a subsequent appeal on the central APC determination, which denied his previous appeal. Appeals were not filed by any other aggrieved parties. The appeal filed by the appellant mainly relies on the same arguments and information as presented in the previous letter to the city. Uh, staff responses to the appeal have been transferred to the council file for your consideration. Based on this information, staff recommends that the Plum Committee deny the appeal and sustain the original determinations by the Central Area Planning Commission. And that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. All right. Uh, now we'll hear from the appellant, uh, followed by the applicant for three minutes each. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak again. <clears throat> yes, this property is uh, just down the hill from me. And uh, I would like to re uh, bring in, if this were cut and paste, I hear some sound on here, please. Um, what I said uh, earlier about these small projects, this particular project would like to demolish a one-story home and demolish a two-story duplex in the back. This is on an alley, so it's not known if there's sufficient width in the alley for uh, emergency vehicles. Also, in terms of uh, procedure, when I attended the central APC, uh, there were only three members of the five-person board present. And when I did a subsequent check to make sure everybody had filed their Form 700, which is a state form, and their Form 60, I found out that one of the three had not for, filed the Form 60. So it's my understanding that there was no quorum present at that meeting, and therefore I would like to request that that meeting be reheld and this item be reconsidered. And I don't want to out the person's name, but just it's Miss Lawrence. She sounds very nice, but. For some reason, she did not turn it in and therefore could not qualify to be a part of the uh, of the meeting uh, and vote on it. And therefore, uh, the denial of my appeal uh, should be considered uh, improper. As far as cum cumulative uh, CEQA, there are a number of projects going up on Waverly Drive, three of them in particular, uh, that are coming online soon, that would be, in a, and this one would be in addition. And I think most people think of CEQA, well, it's gotta be something devastating, some sort of chemical effluent coming out of a giant factory. It doesn't have to be that for small projects like this. It can just be simply that there's a significant increase in traffic at this particular intersection for this particular place. And uh, also, 
to my way of thinking, and I wish I had a legal citation on this, the, uh, the city, the agency, should be doing more to explore the exceptions and not just say, well, let somebody else bring the exception. If they're going to do a full CEQA evaluation of this to prove that it is exempt, they need to do a full evaluation that explores all of the exceptions, all of the possible exceptions, list them in the staff report, and then explain why none of them applies, and they have not done that. So they're deficient in their report, and I ask that you grant my appeal. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Tracy Stone, and I'm the architect for this small lot subdivision. Uh, I just wanted to point out a couple items. Uh, one is that uh, the uh, lot can currently support six units, and we are proposing to build five houses, uh, one of which will have an attached ADU in it. Um, each house will include parking for two cars that's accessed off the alley. The alley is a full 20 feet wide. Um, we are complying with all zoning requirements for this particular project. Each house is three stories tall, but the front one uh, sets back the third floor in deference to the street. Um, and uh, I ask you to please deny the appeal. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. We've heard from the applicant and the, the appellant and the Department of City Planning. Uh, now I'll ask if we can get testimony from Council District 4. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. Again, Michelle Majid, Planning Director for Council Member Nithya Raman. We respectfully recommend that the committee sustain the Central Area Planning's determination and deny the appeal on the basis of a lack of substantial evidence. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. I'm going to move uh, that we deny the appeal as recommended by Council District 4. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Trudillo. Mr. Mejia, can you read the specific instructions into the record and call the roll? Uh, yes. To deny the appeal filed by David Wheatley, thereby sustain the determination of the Central Los Angeles Area Planning Commission in approving the environmental clearance and categorical exemption from CEQA relative to the approval of a vesting track map for a small lot subdivision that will, in, that will contain five small lots, one of the units with an accessory dwelling unit for the property located at 2820 North Avenel Street uh, through 2820 and a half North Avenel, Avenel Street in CD4. And we'll call the row. Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Uh, Council Member Cedillo. Yes. Council Member Bob Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member John Lee. Aye. Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. Five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. Excellent. Thank you so much. That takes us to our 13th and final item. Yes. Item 13, uh, Mr. Chair is a categorical exemption from CEQA, the related findings, report from the planning department and appeal by Susan uh, Gurlnick from the Franklin Corridor Communities. Uh, she's appealing the, the approval of the categorical exemption for a transit oriented communities project that will contain 28 units of which three will be reserved for extremely low income households. All right, Project uh, we have in CD4. Thank you. Uh, do we have a report from Department of City Planning on this item? Yes, you do, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Slum Committee. I am Kevin Golden, City Planner in the Expedited Processing Section. On March 17, 2021, the Director of Planning issued a Class 32 Categorical Exemption, otherwise known as CE32, as the environmental clearance for a project consisting of the construction of a new 28 unit apartment building under the TLC Affordable Housing Incentive Program. On May 20th, 2021, a CEQA appeal was filed by Susan Gurlnick of Franklin Corridor Communities. 
The appeal challenges the director of planning's determination that the project is exempt from CEQA pursuant to CEQA guidelines. Uh, the following is an appeal summary. The five appeal points are as follows. Appeal point number one, there will be a significant impact to traffic. Staff's response to that is that the Los Angeles Planning Department, uh, Transportation Department, excuse me, otherwise known as DOT, as you know, clarified over electronic mail that the daily trips generated by this project would not meet the threshold to require a transportation analysis. So based on DOT's traffic impact criteria, the project would not impose a significant level of impact. Appeal point two. Noise from the activities taking place on the rooftop deck will negatively impact residents in the neighboring buildings. As stated in the CE32, Rencon consultants prepared a noise analysis for the project. Noise levels were revealed to be consistent with general plan noise element guidelines for residential neighborhoods. Residents of the project will be subject to compliance with noise regulations in the same way that project residents or existing residents in the area are. As such, it has been determined that the project will not generate significant operational noise impacts. Appeal point three, the cumulative impact of the nearby projects will increase congestion and make emergency access more difficult. Staff's response to that is that speculation that significant cumulative impacts will occur simply because other projects may be approved in the area is insufficient evidence. California state law requires that drivers yield the right of way to emergency vehicles and remain stopped until the emergency vehicles have passed. Around the project area, multiple lane roadways running north south include Coanga, Highland, La Brea, Fairfax and Crescent Heights. Roadways running east and west include Franklin, Fountain, Sunset, Santa Monica, and Melrose. The appellant has provided no concrete evidence to support her argument that the project will trigger significant cumulative impacts or impacts to emergency access. Appeal point four, the project is at the gateway to the Whitley Heights Historic Preservation Overlay Zone, which is a National Register Historic District, a historic resource of national significance. Staff's response is that the project site is not within a historic preservation overlay zone, and the project site is vacant. No historic resource would be demolished as part of the project. The project does not involve the conversion or alteration of any historic resources. And finally, I get to appeal point five. The project site is designated as being in a very high fire severity zone, and it is also within an aqueous priolo zone, which is an exception to the use of a CE32. Staff's response is that this exception to the use of a categorical exemption does not apply to class 33 exemptions. As stated in CEQA guidelines and in the document, this exception only applies to the class three, class four, class five, class six, and class 11 categorical exemptions. This is a class 32 exemption. Staff acknowledges that the project site in those zones uh, the staff has revised the CE32 written justification for the project file to reflect that. But the fact that the project is located within those boundaries does not create an unusual circumstance because large portions of the city are located within these zones and there's no evidence in the record that indicates that this particular project is more susceptible to fire risks than any other building in its vicinity. Furthermore, the project is in a special grading area, which will require review and approval by the Department of Building and Safety Grading Division. The project is located in a long developed urbanized area and thus will be adequately served by all required public utilities and services. Thus, in conjunction with regulatory compliance measures, RCMs, including fire code, the project will not result in a significant impact. 
So based on the information in the record and considering the appellant's arguments for appeal, staff finds that the project meets the requirements for a class 32 categorical exemption. Therefore, it is recommended that the city council affirm that the project is categorically exempt from CEQA, deny the appeal of the director of planning's determination and sustain the director of planners determination approving TOC case for the pro proposed apartment building. So the official staff recommendation is as follows. Staff recommends that Plum Committee recommendation for city council action to deny the submitted appeal and sustain the director's determination based on the whole of the administrative record that the project is exempt from CEQA pursuant to CEQA guidelines, section 15332, article 19, class 32, and there is no substantial evidence demonstrating that an exception to the categorical exemption pursuant to CEQA guidelines, section 15300.2 applies. And that concludes my presentation. Staff is available, and so is the representative for comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll hear from three minutes each from our appellant and our applicant in that order. Yes, this is John Giroto representing the residents of the Franklin Avenue corridor adjacent to this project in Hollywood, who you've critically heard from today calling in. A neighborhood with 100-year-old infrastructure densely sandwiched between Highland Avenue and Cuenga Avenue are city's two major arteries to the Cuenga Pass and is a gateway to National Register Historic District, Whitley Heights Hillside. The residents ask the council members to allow proper sequel review and necessary risk assessments provided by a sequel review. The project is not providing affordable housing beyond what was demolished, so there's no housing emergency fulfillment. Why waive the sequel review indeed per safety? This is a sensitive site applicable for CEFCO review, a high fire hazard severity zone, a hillside sensitive zone, an Alquist Priello zone, 100 year old failing infrastructure, F rated intersection, National Register Historic District adjacent, and dangerously, this oversized project is the choke point for one of only two routes of emergency egress for all the residents of Whitley Heights Hillside. Great, grant this appeal for safety. This project should not be exempt from sequel review, a review process designed for sensitive sites such as this to ensure resident safety and due diligence. Thank you. Hello, this is Sina Samimi from Jepper Mangles Butler and Mitchell. On behalf of the applicant, I'll be the only one uh, speaking on behalf of the applicant today. Uh, first of all, staff has already done a great job in responding to each of the points of the appeal, and the applicant fully supports staff, as well as the original decision of the director of planning. Uh, I'd like to briefly provide some context on a few additional points. Uh, one is that the appellant bears the burden of showing that unusual circumstances exist that would lead to significant environmental impact, and they have not done so. As to the fire risk, the project site is in a previously developed uh, urbanized area, and it's not within or adjacent to wildland. So uh, there's no showing that the project can actually increase fire risks. As to the liquefaction zone, uh, the project must adhere to building and seismic codes. Uh, so there's no showing that there's an increase in a risk of an earthquake or ground rupture. Further, all of these points that are raised by the appeal, they broadly fall into the category of what's called in the California case law, reverse CEQA. In other words, appellant is complaining that the impact of the project are going to be on future residents of the development itself rather than on the environment. These challenges are not valid under California law and should be disregarded. But finally, the, the project team is committed to being a good neighbor and staying engaged with the community. So in that spirit, the construction team is committed to transparency and responsiveness and is committed to incorporate four voluntary community engagement policies and I'll list them here. One is uh, that they'll post a phone number on the project site so the community always knows who they can reach if an issue arises. 
two, uh, the project site will be kept clean with daily cleanings. Three, uh, they will maintain the security thing so that it is both secure and good aesthetic shape. And finally, the fourth uh, item is that they'll respond to requests by the neighborhood council for project updates uh, so that the community knows when uh, we anticipate starting construction, how the project is progressing. We're confident that this is going to be a big win for the city and the community, and the appeal should be denied. All right, so we've heard from the applicant and the appellant. Uh, do we have comments from Council District 4? Yes, uh, last one, I promise. Uh, so good afternoon again. Michelle Majid, Planning Director for Councilmember Nathia Rahman. We respectfully recommend that the committee sustain the planning department's determination and deny the appeal. Uh, while this project does in fact conform to TOC requirements, the council office is mindful um, and sensitive to some of the community's concerns and we support the applicant putting forward voluntary good neighbor courtesies such as attending neighborhood council meetings to provide timely project updates and before major construction takes place, daily site cleanings during construction, proper fencing at all times, and having either a superintendent or a signage with contact information on site um, at all times during construction. Thank you. Thank you so much. If there's no uh, questions or comments from the committee, I'll move uh, at the rec recommendation of Council District 4 that we deny this appeal. Uh, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Cedillo. Uh, Mr. Mejia, if you could read the specific instructions into the record and call the roll. Uh, yes, to deny the appeal filed by Susan Girlnick from the Franklin Corridors Communities and thereby sustain the determination of the planning director in approving a categorical exemption as the environmental clearance for a proposed transit oriented communities project, which will contain 28 units, three units reserved for extremely low income households for a period of 55 years for the property located at 6555 through 6561 West Franklin Avenue and as stated on the record today at today's meeting by CD4 and by city planner Kevin Golden. I will call the roll. Council member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council member Gilbert Cedillo. Yes. Council member Bob Blumenfield. Aye. Council member John Lee. Aye. And councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. Five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Mejia. Can you confirm that this concludes our business for today? It does, Mr. Chair. It concludes the meeting. Excellent. Excellent. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.